Well, I thought this morning we, uh, you might enjoy going a little bit deeper into the Christmas story and maybe learn some things that you hadn't known before. There's a portion of my sharing this morning that I shared, I was thinking about it, must be 20 years ago when I first shared on the Migdalator, right? How many of you don't know what the Migdalator is? Okay, there's a few of you. But 20 years ago, when I first shared on this, uh, nobody knew what the Migdal Ader was. And I want you to know, if you do your research, you're going to find out that's, in all probability, the very precise place in which the Messiah was born. He wasn't born in a cave where there was uh, stalled donkeys and horses and chickens and goats and no, 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 not at all. And God is so precise in what he does, isn't he? So precise. We've been going through the book of Daniel. We see the preciseness of our Lord, even to the first coming right to the very day. And he said to Israel, if you had known this thy day, the things that make for your peace. But they didn't know. And Daniel was that prophet who was privileged to be able to share with us the second coming of Jesus Christ to the very day. Now, not the coming for the church in the rapture, but I'm talking about when he establishes the millennial kingdom, when he comes to earth for that last and final time to reign forever and ever and ever. Amen? So our God is very, very precise, and he did not, he did not leave the birth of his son, the Messiah, to coincidence. He was very, very specific in all of that as well. You understand that, don't you? Yeah. So let's go to the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. We'll begin here. And if you would like to uh, stay a little longer this morning, we'd like to have a little extended time of fellowship upstairs. We've got some more goodies (laughs) for you to enjoy. So if you'd like to stay, stay with us, and the children can have a good time in the back. I think it's going to be about 70 degrees this afternoon. Yeah. Can we bow our heads and our hearts one more time? Lord, there's an awful lot that's gone on over the last several weeks, Lord, and particularly the last week, and then right up until the celebration that we have all entered into on Friday evening and then yesterday, and Lord, so so much of that can still be in our minds and our hearts, Lord, but right now, I just ask that you clear our minds, that you would give us the ability to receive what you have for each of us this morning. So, Lord, as we take a deep breath, everybody take a deep breath. (sighs) We want to receive of you, Lord. Help us to keep out of our minds anything else that may be occupying us, Lord. Any plans or events that we have for after the service, Lord. Anything at all, Lord. We just pray that you don't allow our distracted minds to keep us from receiving what you would have for us this morning. And Lord, I ask that you would bless each and every one of us myself, those in my hearing here in this sanctuary, those over the internet, Lord. And Lord, those who may listen to this message yet in the future, Lord, may they see how you leave nothing, nothing to coincidence, nothing to chance, Lord. You are sovereign. It's no wonder in the ancient Hebrew language there was no Hebrew word for coincidence. Coincidence, not a kosher word, is it, Lord? No. You're in complete and total control. And we thank you, Lord, that your sovereignty is our sanity in these crazy times in which we live today. So, Lord, may your hope, your peace, your joy, your love enter into our lives once again this morning as we sit at your feet. And we ask all this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Okay, so when did that happen? Precisely, exactly. Anybody know? Anybody want to venture a guess? 4 BC? Caesar Augustus required a census three times during his reign. The first time was in 8 B.C., the next time was in 2 B.C., and the last time was in 6 A.D. 
Now, the one we're in concerned about in particular right now is the one in 2 BC, because that's the record that we're reading now. This is 2 BC, when he required the census, and everyone had to go back to the place of their birth, their home, the home place. Verse 3, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and of the lineage of David. So why was it called the city of David, Bethlehem? Because that's where David was born, the city of David. And Joseph had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem because he was of the lineage of David. But not only was Joseph of the lineage of David, who else was of the lineage of David? Mary, Mary. Mary. Yeah, so he was of the lineage of David by his stepfather, Joseph, and by his biological mother, Mary. And so he had to make that trek, that trek. So, verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths. And laid him in a manger. More specifically, it's in a definitive article in the Greek text. Laid him in the manger. The manger. The translation is not as accurate as it should be in this case. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Jesus was born. So when was Jesus born? December the 25th? No. He wasn't? Satu was born December 25th, weren't you? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, Satu. Yeah. <laughs> what, what a Christmas gift you were to your parents, eh? <laughs> but Jesus wasn't born on September 25th. When was Jesus born? September. September how do you know that? <laughs> so, well, let's, let's, let's pursue what the Word has to tell. Now, we always go back to the Word, right? We want the Word to validate whatever it is that we believe. So let's look over here at chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel. We want to find now the timing. When was Jesus born, actually? And i sorry to say, I'm not going to be able to give you an exact date, but I am going to be able to give you a time frame. And I do believe I'm going to be able to give you a period in which he was born. Chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have taken into hand to set in order the narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us, them to us. It seemed good to me. Who's me? Luke. Luke. Luke, Luke, the only Gentile writer of the Bible, right? Luke wrote two books. He wrote Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus name you ever heard, isn't it? The- no, it's not. Theophilus. What does it mean? Lover of God. Theophileo. Theophileo, lover of God. Was this an actual person? Yes, but was this his actual name? No. No, Luke is speaking in code because this is a, this is a high-ranking gov- uh, government official in the Roman government, and so his identity has to be kept secret because he's, he's become a believer in Jesus Christ. And now, you'll see in the book of Acts, he also writes the book of Acts as a record for Theophilus to have. So that's who he's writing to about this account of the birth of Christ and the ministry of Jesus. That you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. He was discipled in Christ. Now, particularly to the time frame of when Jesus was born. There was in the days of Herod, all right, let's stop there. What were the days of Herod? How long did Herod reign? That's right. He reigned from 37 B.C. Make a little note in your Bible. From 37 B.C. to 1 B.C., okay? He died June, uh, Jan- uh, January 14th, 1 B.C., Herod. That was the reign of Herod. So we know it's during Herod's reign. King of Judea. A certain priest named Zacharias. What does Zacharias mean? God remembers. Isn't that interesting? Jot that down. Zach, look, just in the names of the parents and John himself, the forerunner who would bear the, the uh, privilege of 
declaring the coming of the Messiah just in the names of himself and his parents is the gospel message. Did you know that? Zacharias means God remembers. Zacharias of the division of Abagi. Now, what does that mean, the division of Abagi? The priests. David had set up when the priests would serve. There were more priests than needed to serve in the temple at various times. So if you go back to uh, First Chronicles 24, you don't need to turn there now, later on in your leisure, uh, go back to First Chronicles chapter 24, read the beginning of that chapter, and you'll see that David had established the order in which the priests would serve. So he was in the order of Abagi, and he's going to serve in the temple. He's going to light the altar of incense. He's going to burn incense upon the altar of incense in the holy place. And that'll be the only time he'll ever be able to do that in his entire life. This one time. And it's recorded for us here. A certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abagi. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, a descendant of Aaron. Her name was? And which means God's oath or covenant. Wow. Wow. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord, blameless. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in age. And we know that John, being a, a, a child of the priest, priest being Zacharias, his parents were very old when he was born. They died when he was young. And so where was he raised? Qumran down in the Dead Sea area. The Qumran sect of very religious, very pious, very spiritual men. They thought the Pharisees were way too liberal for them. So that's why they separated themselves from them. Uh, there's a, a lot of correlation between what the Qumran sect believe, those residents of Qumran believed, and, and what we believe is the body of Christ today, those who are really fundamental, believing the fundamental truths of the word of God, you see, and the sect of, the, of Qumran. So John was raised in that. One of the emphasis that the Qumran priest placed on an understanding of the word of God, and particularly eschatology, was what? The coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah. They would speak of the coming of the Messiah and look at the scriptures that would indicate the coming of the Messiah quite often. So John was raised up in it. He was schooled in that. Okay? And Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in age. And so it was, while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, he was of the eighth division, the order of Abagi. If you go back to First Chronicles, we won't do that now for time's sake, but if you go back to First Chronicles chapter 24, you'll find out that his division, the Abagi division, was the eighth division. He served on July 13th, 3 B.C., the only time in his life he would do this. July, thir July 13th is a significant date for me, too. You know why? Me boy. Me boy was born on July 13th. But anyway, and he's not a priest, but anyway, he's a, he's, pro he's a pastor. Yeah. But anyway, this is the date. Mark it down. He's of the 8th division at verse 7, July 13th, 3 B.C. he served. You got that? That's the only time in his life he would do this. And what are we determining? What are we trying to discover here? When was Jesus was born? Don't, don't, let, don't lose sight of what we're trying to do here. I'm going to give you a lot of information. And if you don't get it all this morning, that's okay. You can go back and review the tape if it interests you. It interests me. I like this sort of thing. I hope you do too. But this is July 13, 3 B.C. And so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense. When he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. What were they praying? I'm sorry? For deliverance, for the Messiah to come. The very people were praying for the coming of the Messiah, and what's going to be revealed to Zacharias, the priest, is the coming of the Messiah, and his son would be the forerunner to his coming. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zacharias saw him, and he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. What do you think your reaction would be if you saw an angel? <laughs> You'd be afraid. 
<laughs> you'd be very frightened and you'd fall on your face too. You know, it's, it's, it's sad how, how misunderstood angels are today in our world and particularly in the church. You see these cute little cherub and it, no, no, angels were warriors. Angels, now their primary task is to defeat the demons that are trying to thwart God's work in the life of his children. Yeah, you'd be frightened if you ever saw an angel as Zacharias was. And, but the angel said to him, verse 13, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you should call his name John. What does John mean? Now listen, this, listen, listen, the gospel, just in the meaning of their names. Zachariah means, Elizabeth means, his oath of covenant. John means, God remembers his covenant to be gracious. Wow, isn't that amazing? Just in the meaning of their names, the gospel is found here. <laughs> Fantastic. Speaking of John, verse 14, the six characteristics of this man who would be born, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." Hmm. Verse 23, jump down there now. And so it was. As soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself for five months. Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. Now, it was a great honor for women in that day to have children, and especially to bear sons for their husband. That was their 401k, their insurance that were being taken care of in their old age. Elizabeth and Zacharias were very old at this point, and she had never borne any children, so that was a, she carried some shame in that. But now God has taken away her reproach and her shame, and she's bearing her son. What year would this have happened in? That's it, good. Who said that? You're paying attention. Thank you, Carolyn. 3 B.C. So note that this is verse 23. When she conceived, it would have been, uh, and if we go back to when Zacharias was serving, and, you know, when God does something, he does it quickly. Even in their old age, he didn't need Viagra, did he? No, 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 no. My grandfather told me a long time ago, Alfonso, when he says, if, you, if you're if you going to pick a wife, Rich, Rich, and don't worry about the look, and worry about the cooking. The looking as she goes, the cooking as stays. <laughs> it's not bad advice. <laughs> but nonetheless, nonetheless, this would be uh, probably around July, August 3 B.C. that she conceived. And now she hid herself for five months. Now look at verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Pregnancy. Her pregnancy. So now, now we're looking at the December B.C. 3 or the January B.C. 2 time frame, okay? This is December, January time frame. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, for the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Jesus. And he will be great. And he will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. Praise the Lord. Now, it's yet to be, it's yet to take place that he'll establish his kingdom on earth, but he has taken possession or at least taken authority and the title deed of the earth, which one day he will soon possess. Amen. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? 
The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative has conceived also a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. So this is December 3 B.C., or it is January 2 B.C., somewhere in that time frame. Now, there's only three people that knew that Elizabeth was pregnant at this time. Zacharias, Elizabeth, and now Mary. The angel revealed this to her. Now, go over to, we're going to talk about Elizabeth and, and Elizabeth's blessing, but go to verse 57 of chapter 1. Now Elizabeth's time had come for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. John was the cousin of Jesus. John was how much older than Jesus? Six months. This is what the text is telling us. And so we know about when John was conceived, so we know about when John was birthed. John would have been birthed when? Around April 2 B.C. April 2 B.C. Okay? Jesus is six months younger. John was six months older. So when would Jesus be born? September, October. So he was clearly not born in December, was he? Who determined that we would celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th? The Romans did. Who was it specifically? Constantine. Constantine established Christianity as a religion of the state overnight. All of these pagan priests and priestesses became Christian priests and priestesses, and the corruption occurred in the church, unfortunately. A lot of corruption came into the church in the paganism and the mystery Babylonian religious system came into the church. That, if you'd like to study that, it's really interesting. But nonetheless, it was around 325 or so, 312, somewhere in that neighborhood, that Constantine established Christianity, or excuse me, established the celebration of Christmas being on December 25th. And why did they choose December 25th? It was already a pagan holiday. They were already celebrating the winter solstice, right? The shortest day of the year. Now the, the sun's returning. So that's why they picked December 25th. But we know that Jesus was born somewhere between September and October. What happens during that time that's so significant in the life of the Jewish people? The fall feasts. The fall feasts. You have the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and you have the Feast of Tabernacles. It was revealed that his name shall be called Jesus, but in Isaiah, it was revealed to us that a virgin shall conceive. That's the sign. A woman who has never known a man, a virgin, will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit and become impregnated, and she will bear the Messiah. And you shall call his name, which means... So what feast of those three fall feasts would be more in line with Jesus tabernacling with us? Oh, very good, very good. The Feast of Tabernacles. So it is my conjecture, okay, that I, I strongly believe that Jesus was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. God with us. We'll find out when we get to heaven. We'll ask him specifically. But it was not in December. It was not in the winter months. It was in the fall, during the fall festive period. Now, when we talk about the second coming of Jesus. He came the first time, so he could come again. Aren't you? Are you excited about his coming? Yeah. I am. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Every time we approach the fall festive period, for I get so excited because I, I do believe that these are God's appointments, that God fulfilled the first four on the very day. He's going to fulfill the last three on the very day. And the Feast of Trumpets is coinciding with what? Eschatological event? The rapture, the rapture of the church. And Yom Kippur is associated with what? Eschatological event? The awakening of Israel, the Jew, in who Jesus truly is. They'll see him for who he is, their Messiah. And then the last fall feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. And what's going to take place then? That Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom on earth. Born on the Feast of Tabernacles, and I believe he's going to return to earth and establish his kingdom on the Feast of Tabernacles. Emmanuel, God dwelling with us or tabernacling with us. Makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? What did I say about ancient Hebrew? There's, there's one word, there's no word in the ancient Hebrew for what word? Isn't that coincidence? 
Okay, so, so we know about when, right? It was about September, October. It was during the fall festive period that he was born. Okay, but what about the where? Well, let's discover where he was born. Do you know there's, there's Bethlehem, old little town of Bethlehem, right? And then there was Bethlehem Ephrata. You know the difference between the town and the district or zone called Bethlehem Ephrata? It was the agricultural zone or district outside of the little town of Bethlehem. But it was all considered Bethlehem, okay? Bethlehem. What does that mean? House of bread. Who was born in the house of bread? The bread of life. Wow, isn't that coincidental? No, not hardly, is it? No, no. All right, Acts, uh, Luke, chapter 2. Let's go there. You with me so far? You find this interesting or you want to go home? Okay, we'll keep going. And it came to pass, chapter 2, Luke's gospel, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Crianus was governing Syria. All right, we've already established there were three census that, that Augustus had declared. The one in particular that we're concerned about that they're talking about here in chapter 2 happened in when? 2 BC. 2 BC, thank you. This census first took place while Crianius was governing Syria, and we've already established that Jesus was born around 2 B.C., somewhere between September and October time frame, at 2 B.C. This census first took place while Crianius was governing Syria. It all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee to the city of Nazareth and to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. <laughs> And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Uh, she conceived around uh, somewhere about December 3 B.C., and they had nine months to that, and we come to September 2 B.C., so again, proof of Jesus' birth was somewhere in September, October that year, 2 B.C., she brought forth the firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in what? The, the manger here. The, it's a definite article, the, meaning there is a specific manger they're talking about, not just any manger, okay? Just as uh, when you go to looking at the first establishment of the feast of Passover, God instructs the people through Moses to pick a lamb, right? And then any lamb. But then as you go down further into the text, you see he identifies it as the lamb that although there were thousands of lambs sacrificed that evening, that first Passover when they were making their exodus from Egypt, God only saw it as the one, the one lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Now take the lamb, and then it says, the lamb, Jesus Christ, right? And kill it, it, one, singular. So it's foreshadowing the, the birth and the death of Jesus Christ, as John, was, John Michael was pointing out. You can't separate his death and resurrection and ascension from his birth. They're so tied together. Now, manger. What is the word manger here? Anybody know? Fatne. Yeah, fatne. That's the word. Fatne. Fatne is a crib or a stall. It, 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 um, it's always interpreted a feeding trough. But this is a particular manger, the manger that is being spoken of here. It's a sign that he would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. The swaddling cloths, if you go back to your Greek lexicon, these are the strips of cloth that the baby would be wrapped in. Why do you, why do you cover an infant's hands when they're first born? Why would they do that? We, we come in desiring our own self-destruction. No, it's crazy. Isn't it? No, you, you cover their hands so they don't scratch themselves or cut themselves because their fingernails are already grown, right? Yeah, I wish my hair would grow as fast as my fingernails. That ain't happening anymore. But nonetheless, okay, they would wrap the baby in swaddling clothes so that they would be protected, right? Now, verse 8, now there were in the same country. What country is this? Bethlehem. And when we go back into the prophecy of Micah, we're going to see it's Bethlehem Ephrathah, right? Which is? The agricultural zone or district. What does uh, Ephrathah mean? 
fruitful, fruitful, indicating it was the agricultural district. That's what it means, fruitful. Now, in the same country, there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Jesus was the shepherd, wasn't he? He's the shepherd of the flock. It's a great flock. What does John call him? The good shepherd. Hebrews calls him the great shepherd. First Peter calls him the chief shepherd of the flock. Make no, listen, make no mistake. Every one of us are just under shepherds of the true chief shepherd. There's only one shepherd of the flock. Is that right? One flock, one shepherd. Hmm? I'm not even an under shepherd. You know what I am? Sheepdog. sheepdog. Every shepherd has to have a good sheepdog, and that's my job. I'm a good sheepdog, right? Right? <laughs> And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Before who? The shepherds. The shepherds. Now, these are just not ordinary shepherds. How did most of the population of Israel look at shepherds? What was their opinion of shepherds? Yeah, they were, they were like, uh, well, they were a necessity, but they weren't thought of very well. But not these shepherds. This is a different group of shepherds. I'll share that in a moment. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, the shepherds, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. See, every t if you see an angel, the first thing you're going to experience is fear. Fear, make no doubt about that. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David. Why is it the city of David? It's the place of David's birth. It's the city of... Bethlehem, but it wasn't the little town of Bethlehem. It was Bethlehem Ephrata. It was the agricultural zone in which he was born. We'll see that in a moment. Do not be afraid, behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord, right? What's Christ mean? Christos? Same word as Mashiach, Messiah. Christ, Messiah. Ma, uh, Christos is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word, Mashiach, the Messiah, okay? Lord, kurios, what does that mean? Master, supreme, supreme in heaven and on earth. Master of the universe. Not masters of the universe, you know, like in DC comic books, but no, master of the universe. But he is the Lord Jesus the Christ. Isn't that how he's always referred? Lord meaning supreme, ruler. Jesus, Yahshua, Jehovah Shua, meaning I am salvation. That's what it literally means. But be, listen to me now, listen closely. So many people have this upside down, have this reversed. He is Lord before he is Savior, the Christ. Do you understand? A lot of people no longer have any appetite for lordship salvation. And what do I mean by lordship salvation? He, he rules my life. His love rules our life, but through his word. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I command you to do? You see, if he's not Lord of your life, he's not Lord at all of any part of your life. He is the Lord, Koryo, supreme ruler. Isn't it interesting when the Apostle Paul was persecuting the church and tradition teaches us that he imprisoned or persecuted or murdered as many as 30,000 Christians before he was apprehended by grace. That's why he said, I was the chief of sinners. But when he was apprehended by grace and that light shone around him, he said, who are you, Lord? Kodios. And what was the response? I am Jesus, Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. Did Paul debate him? Did Paul argue with him? Did Paul question that? Not at all. What was the next response? Lord, what would you have me to do? And Paul served him for the rest of his life, didn't he? That's lordship salvation. So where he is not Lord, he is not Yeshua, Savior, the Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one. Right? Just a side note. Something you should share. I shared that yesterday with someone. Very important that you understand that. My sanctification validates my... Sanctification. 
How long have you been with me and you don't know these things? My sanctification, my Christ-likeness, my, the Holy Spirit working in me to perfect me, to change me, to allow Christ to live his life through me, through the person of the Holy Spirit. My sanctification validates and affirms my justification, my salvation. Jesus said, you will know them by their profession. No. By their lip? No. By their life. You'll know them by their fruits. Fruits. That's how you can tell. How many, t- how many times have I said to you? Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen with your eyes, not your ears. Listen with your eyes, not your ears. You watch a person's life, and that'll tell you. Hmm? It's come to a place in our culture where your children's participation in sporting events is more important than sacred days. Hmm. All right, I won't get on that soapbox. I'll, I'll restrain myself. <laughs> For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. Wait a minute now. This is a specific sign, an indicator, uh, a, a, a code to you. To who? To the shepherds. This sign, and this is what it indicates, this is a sign, this is a message, this is in code specifically to you. You shepherds, you'll understand what this sign is. That's what the angel said. And this is a sign to you, to no one else but the shepherds. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now, how could these shepherds understand this sign that was given to them specifically? Well, because they were a very specific group of shepherds. They weren't just not ordinary shepherds. Now, uh, Eusebius, a church father, around 400, he said that there was no doubt that all of the flocks and all of the shepherds that were raising their sheep at Bethlehem Ephrathah, at the agricultural district, were all Levitical shepherds under rabbinical authority. Levitical shepherds. And what would that be? What would be a Levitical shepherd? under rabbinical authority from Jerusalem, six miles away. They were temple shepherds, very specifically, raising these sheep very specifically for the sacrifice and the worship of Hashem. What's Hashem? The name. They won't even speak the name for fear they mispronounce it, but they'll say the name for Jesus, for God, right, for Jehovah. Now, what was required of these lambs that were a year or under to be sacrificed in these various feasts and sacrifices that would take place, the daily sacrifices, etc., etc.? I mean, hundreds of thousands of sheep would be sacrificed throughout the year. What was required of these sacrificial animals? Yeah, what you said. That, that they were to be without blemish, no birth defects, right? And, and, and without blemish, without spot. No injury, no birth defects, no injury. If they were born with birth defects, then they were put aside and sold to the market. If they were a perfect specimen, then they were raised specifically for the sacrifice to Hashem. And they had to be careful that they did not hurt themselves. They weren't injured in any way. So that's how these shepherds would have known that. There was a very specific place where the ewes that they would watch, and and, and during the year, as the ewes were about to drop to give birth to their their lambs, they would be brought into a cleansed area, very ceremonially cleansed, spotless. And that's where they would birth these lambs who would be born for the purpose of worshiping God. What was the name of that place? The tower of the flock is the English interpretation of the Hebrew, the Migdal Edar. M-I-G-D-A-L-E-D-E-R. Migdal Edar. Where is it first mentioned? Genesis chapter 35. Turn there. We have here a record of a beautiful you giving birth, but in giving birth to her child... She dies. Who is that? Rachel. Rachel Rachel means you. Beautiful you. You lamb. 
Not beautiful Y-O-U, but beautiful U lamb, right? Look at uh, verse, let's go to verse 16. Verse 16 of Genesis 35. If you're there, look up. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when they were a little bit of distance to go to Ephrath, that's the fruitful district of Bethlehem, Rachel travailed in childbirth and had a hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, and his father called him Benjamin, Benoni, son of my sorrow. But Jacob said, no, 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 he's not the son of my sorrow. He's Benjamin, which is the son of my right arm or son of my strength. Verse 19, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel, Jacob, journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adar, the Migdal Adar. This is the first mention of the tower of the flock. Now, do you know who gave all of those sacred lands around Bethlehem there in that, in that agricultural district or zone to be used for the raising of these sheep for temple sacrifice? David, the king. It was his ancestral land, and he gave it to the priests to use for this specific purpose. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> this descendant of David who would be born in that very place. Now turn with me to uh, Micah, the prophet Micah. I'll give you some time to get there. In chapter 4 of Micah, the prophet, uh, beginning in verse 6, anybody have a heading over that verse 6 in your Bible? Say, I'm sorry, one at a time. Say it again. Uh, Zion's future triumph. Zion's future triumph. Anybody else? Israel's return from exile. Israel's return from exile. Anybody else? The Lord shall rescue Zion. The Lord shall rescue Zion. Same thing. Same thing. And that. Yes. God is promising here he's going to reestablish his people back into their ancient homeland, and he is going to dwell among them, and he will dwell among them and be their king and establish their kingdom forever and ever and ever. But it's interesting where it claims he's going to be coming from. Look with me now in chapter 4. Verse 6, in that day says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcasts and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them at Mount Zion from now on, even forevermore, establishing his, his millennial reign for a thousand years. And then after that, his reign forever and ever and ever. That's what they're talking about here. And you, oh, what does it say, verse 8? And you, oh, Tower of the flock, Hebrew, Migdal Edar. The stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. This is a messianic prophecy concerning the coming of the Christ and establishing his kingdom, Israel, to reign as a supreme nation of the nations of the world once again. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. Do you have a heading over verse 2? Birth of the Messiah. Anything, anybody have anything else? Something else? I'm sorry? The ruler to be born in Bethlehem. The ruler of the universe. Anybody else? The coming Messiah. Look at verse 2 of chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Right? Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus whose goings forth have been from the 
from old, from everlasting. Speaking of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, speaking of the Migdal Eder. Now, uh, any of you have the, uh, um, the Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Edersheim? Good, good. I've recommended that you, you know, get this. He, was, he wrote in the late 1800s, a devout Christian, and 20 years ago I came across this text that talks about the Messiah being born at the Migdal Eder. And that's how I found interest in this and began to study it, and that's the first time I taught it here at the chapel. But here in uh, book two, um, chapter five, he records that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem was a settled conviction. Agree? Agree. Equally so was the belief that he was to be revealed from the Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock. This Migdal Eder was not the watchtower for the ordinary flocks which pastured on the barren sheep ground beyond Bethlehem, but lay close to the town. Now, Eusebius, Eusebius confirms that that's exactly what took place, and he said the place where these sheep were raised was a Roman mile from the little town of Bethlehem. A little town. Anybody know what a Roman mile was? About 1,000 feet, half of a mile from our reckoning, right? Something like that. So he indicates the same thing here, uh, Eusebius, back in the 400. This Migdal Eder was not the watchtower for the ordinary flocks which pastured on the barren sheep ground beyond Bethlehem, but lay close to the town on the road to Jerusalem. How far was Bethlehem from Jerusalem? Six miles. That's right, six miles. A passage in the Mishnah. What is the Mishnah? The Mishnah is the oral, the translation of the oral tradition of the Jews. The oral law was translated into the Mishnah. And he's talking about a passage in the Mishnah, Shekelim, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. Rabbi Monk. No, not the Monk TV series, okay? It's a different, this is a different investigating Monk. Of the herds in the space between Jerusalem and the tower of the flock, the Migdal Eder, and on both sides, the males are for burnt offerings and the females are for peace offerings. So it's mentioned here by Rabbi Monk that when you raise these sheep for sacrifice, when the Levitical priests under the order of the rabbis were raising these sheep, all of them were raised for specific purposes and you separated by gender. And it says here that the, the males were used for what purpose? And what is a burnt offering? The burnt offering in the Hebrew is a holocaust. Jesus was a burnt offering, was the burnt offering, the holocaust of God for the sins of the world. And females were, were a peace offering, peace offering. And he was the prince of peace as well, wasn't he? Yes, a passage in the Mishnah, Mishnah leads to the conclusion that the flocks that which pastured there were destined for temporal sacrifices, temple sacrifices. And accordingly, that the shepherds who watched over them were not ordinary shepherds. The latter were under the ban of rabbinism on account of their necessi necessary isolation from religious ordinances and their manner of life, which, re which rendered strict legal observances unlikely, if not absolutely impossible. Now, what they're talking about here is that the temple shepherds, and I won't go into any more detail. You've probably given you more information than you want right now. But uh, it's a really worth your read, Edersheim's Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Speaking of the Migdal Eder by Edersheim. No pun intended. <laughs> these shepherds had one specific purpose, raising these sheep and caring for them for the sacrifice to God. When these ewes were about to deliver, these temple shepherds would bring them into the tower, the Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock, into the center of the tower, which was cleansed, spotless. And they would allow these, these ewes, they would help them give birth. And as soon as these lambs were birthed, they were examined for any birth defects, any blemishes, and then they were wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in the manger. There was one manger in particular that they would lay these newborn lambs in, and then the rabbis would come and unwrap the lambs and examine them. 
suitable for sacrifice. And then they were carefully raised and cared for until they were brought to Jerusalem for the worship of God. Isn't that interesting? So when the angel came to those temple shepherds out in the fields, and they said, this is a sign to you that a babe is born in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Wow. They knew exactly where to go. What was their response? Go back to Luke chapter 2. turning your pages of your Bible. You know what a beautiful sound that is? You know how many mega churches you can go into today and you won't find a single Bible? I don't know what the purpose of the gathering is. Verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. And so it was that when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go and search for the child and all over Bethlehem and we'll find him. You go to the west, I'll go to the east. You go north, I'll go south. We'll find this kid. Is that what they said? Isn't that interesting? Look, they, they didn't have to wonder at all. They didn't have a GPS, right? He didn't leave them with instructions, but they knew enough to know exactly where to go. And so when the angels had gone from them, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. There's no delay. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Wow. So now you know when. Now you know where. And you got something interesting to tell a lot of people who have no idea. What the, 20 years ago when I first taught this, everybody I ever ran into knew nothing about the Migdalator. It is no coincidence that God would have his son, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, born, born in that very place where these lambs, which were a type, a shadow, a symbol, a sign of the one to come, would be raised and birthed and cared for. Those sheep who would later be, be brought into the sheep's gate, into Jerusalem for sacrifice, that very sheep's gate that Jesus himself would walk into. Surrounded by those same sheep that represented his sacrifice. Wow. Any coincidence? No, not hardly. Not at all. There, there is so much for you and I to explore and discover about God's truth that will continually put our hearts in wonder. David closed the worship set by saying, Lord, let us know of all, all of your marvelous works. And I said, well, I'm not prepared to tell them about all of God's marvelous works. And what did you say? What did you say? That Paul has revealed to us through the person of the Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians that throughout the ages to come, God is going to be revealing these wonders, these secrets, these marvelous mysteries of God to us. You're never, ever, ever going to grow tired of hearing about how awesome our God is, how precise he is in everything. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. I hope maybe this study this morning has drawn you a little closer to him. I hope maybe this study this morning has, has, has instigated, excited an appetite in you for more study into the word of God. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know, and it just causes me to want to know more and more and more. And we will never, ever, ever exhaust the wonder of our God, ever throughout eternity to come. May the true Lamb of God, the Christ of Christmas, enter into your life so that we don't experience Christmas one day a year, do we? How often do we experience Christmas? 
every day, every day. Amen? Shall we stand? Pastor David, you got a closing song?